Today is a very special day for Jeffrey the skeleton, because we're gonna talk about one of the most incredible tissues in the human body, and that is bone tissue. Now, even though we're used to associating bones and skeletons with death and certain holidays like Halloween, bone tissue is very much a living and dynamic tissue that is continuously changing and remodeling, meaning that your bones are constantly building up new bone tissue and also breaking down old bone tissue. But why and how does bone tissue do this? And how much can you influence the health of your bones with diet, exercise, and lifestyle choices? Well, today we're gonna answer all these questions by going inside bones and showing you what makes bones so strong and hard. And one of my favorite things, how blood and nutrients are somehow delivered through what seems to be a completely solid structure. And again, how you can influence it and reduce your risk of certain conditions like osteoporosis. Jeffrey the Skeleton believes this is going to be one of the most anatomically awesome videos of all time, but he's obviously a bit biased. Either way, let's do this. So let's start with how bone may not be quite as solid as we think. If we look at one of Jeffrey's bones here, this outer portion of the bone is called compact bone. Compact bone is the dense outer portion of all bones. And even though it is the more dense type of bone tissue, it can be relatively thin at the ends of bones. And as you can see, it didn't take much to chip it away on some of Jeffrey's bone ends here to expose the other type of bone tissue underneath, which we'll get into in just a little while. But on the shafts of long bones, you can see that compact bone gets much thicker, like here on the tibia that we cut into. Now, to the unaided eye, compact bone looks like a completely dense and solid material. However, if we zoom in to the microscopic level, we're going to see that compact bone is quite porous. So if we were to say like cut through Jeffrey's femur, which is what the left side of this picture is showing you, and then we zoomed into a small section of that cut, that will take us to the bottom right of the picture. And if you look closely, you can see an intricate miniature system of interconnected canals throughout the bone. And these canals contain blood vessels. Plus, you can also see what appears to be these repeating circular structural units. And each one of these units is called an osteon. Now, just take a moment to realize how ridiculously awesome it is that your compact bone is organized into these little units called osteons because they are actually aligned in the same direction and parallel to the length of the bone, which gives the bone a considerable amount of strength. But what's even cooler is what these units do. So if we zoom into the osteon, you can see that it is made up of multiple concentric rings or circular plates of bone. And these circular plates are actually solid, hard bone tissue. If you look even closer, embedded in each ring are cells called osteocytes, which is a pretty great name because osteo refers to bone and site means cell. But these cells are in charge of maintaining the bone tissue through exchanging nutrients and waste products with the blood. But here's the thing, those cells are stuck in the hard bone tissue. So how do you distribute the nutrients through that tissue? Well, if you look at the center of the osteom, you will see a central canal with blood vessels. And before the bone hardened and those osteocytes got stuck, they sent out what you call cytoplasmic extensions, like little cellular arms to reach out and touch their neighboring osteocytes, literally connecting together. Not only does an osteocyte connect with other osteocytes in its own ring, but they also send out extensions to connect with osteocytes in the ring behind them. And then that ring of osteocytes connects to the ring behind them, and that ring of osteocytes connects to the ring behind them. Now, I'm sorry if I'm getting a little overly excited about this, but as you can see, bone is pretty anatomically awesome, and we're still not done yet, because all of the actual hard bone tissue that makes up those circular plates of bone is also referred to as the extracellular matrix. And what makes up this extracellular matrix gives bone its hard characteristics, as well as a little bit of flexibility. And this is also going to help us understand questions about bone health and even certain health conditions. So if we zoom in even more between these cells and into this extracellular matrix, you will see that bone is made up of collagen and this hard crystal-like substance called hydroxyapatite. And yes, you heard me right, I said collagen. Collagen isn't just for our skin, it's the most abundant protein in the human body. And we'll get into the importance of collagen for bone in just a second. But let's actually start with the substance that is unique to bone and technically teeth as well, but 
That again is this hard crystal-like substance called hydroxyapatite. And this gives bone its hard characteristics and gives bone an incredible amount of strength, specifically helping bone to resist compression or being crushed. Now hydroxyapatite is kind of a funny name, but hydroxyapatite is actually made up of calcium phosphate and calcium hydroxide. And the substance that probably stood out to you there was calcium. And this helps us to understand why calcium is so important for bone health. You need it to make hydroxyapatite and give bone its strength to resist compression. And as an FYI, vitamin D is also important because you need it to absorb calcium. But let's quickly come back to the collagen. Collagen is a protein fiber that has tremendous tensile strength, meaning it helps bone resist being pulled apart. And remember, hydroxyapatite gives bone its compressive strength. Now, a healthy bone is made up of about 30% collagen and 55% hydroxyapatite. And this ratio is important because when it's off, it can lead to certain diseases or conditions. Maybe you've heard of something like osteomalacia, which translates to soft bone, or even rickets. Now, this is typically caused by a vitamin D deficiency, and then that person can't absorb calcium properly, and then they can't make hydroxyapatite. And that will mess up the ratio of collagen and hydroxyapatite. So you kind of, in a way, get a higher proportion of collagen than you're supposed to compared to the hydroxyapatite, and the bones get softer, and they can literally bend and become deformed. Now you can contrast to that kind of like an opposite disease called osteogenesis imperfecta. Now that's not a disease that a lot of people have heard about, but maybe you've seen this movie called Unbreakable. It had Bruce Willis and Samuel L. Jackson in it, and then they made a sequel years and years later called Split, and then a third sequel called Mr. Glass, and Samuel L. Jackson's character was Mr. Glass because he had this disease, osteogenesis imperfecta, and it's a problem with synthesizing collagen. And so what happens is, is you don't get enough collagen in the bone, and the bones start to become more brittle, and they break easy, and there's a couple of scenes where he breaks his bones in the movies, but all three of those movies are pretty cool. Go watch them after you finish this video. But that's one of these things that shows us that that ratio of hydroxyapatite and collagen is really important to optimal bone health. So hopefully to this point, we've given you a really powerful why as to the importance of things like calcium and vitamin D to bone health. And we're also gonna obviously touch on why exercise can be so influential with bone health. But first, I need to talk about the other type of bone tissue that's deep to compact bone, and then we'll get to exercise. Deep to compact bone, you have what's called spongy bone. And just by looking at this picture, you can kind of see why they called it spongy bone. Now, it's an amazing intricate network as well, but you'll notice spongy bone is made up of these tiny little beams of bone, and these beams are actually called trabeculae. And that's why sometimes spongy bone is also referred to as trabecular bone. But because there's little spaces between the trabeculae, blood vessels can actually weave in and out and get close enough to the cells that make up those little beams of bone. But just still keep in mind, all those beams of bone will still have collagen and hydroxyapatite. Now something else that's extremely important within spongy bone is that also suspended in some of those spaces of spongy bone is red bone marrow. And what red bone marrow does is it produces your red blood cells, also known as erythrocytes, your white blood cells, also known as leukocytes, and your platelets, also known as thrombocytes. Most of us have a pretty good idea that red blood cells, their main job is to carry oxygen, white blood cells are about body defenses and immunity, and then platelets are about clotting the blood. So this is what's so cool. Not only are those blood vessels moving throughout the bone, the compact bone and the spongy bone, to supply nutrients for the bone itself, but it will also pass through that red bone marrow and pick up all those different types of blood cells and then take it out to distribute throughout the rest of the body. Now, red bone marrow is distributed in specific places in the adult skeleton, mostly in the axial skeleton, which is the central skeleton. So like the skull, the spine, the sternum, the rib cage, and even the pelvic bones. And you can even see some in the proximal humerus as well as the proximal femur. But before we leave spongy bone, I do want to illustrate the same idea that we mentioned with compact bone. Remember with compact bone, we said those osteons, those cylindrical units, were organized in parallel rows with each other to give strength along the length of those long bones especially. Spongy bone, those tiny little beams of bone, when you first look at them, they might look like they're kind of random, but they are not random. They are organized to deal with the direct lines of stress that the bone undergoes. So essentially we have this marvelous biological architecture designed inside of our bones. It's incredible. But 
Let's talk about exercise and how that can relate and improve your bone health. Remember during the intro when I said bone is this dynamic living tissue that's constantly remodeling, meaning you're constantly breaking down and taking away old bone tissue and replacing it with new bone tissue. Now to help us understand that to some level, I do want to mention a couple other cells. We learned about the osteocyte already, but there's another cell called an osteoclast. And this osteoclast resorbs or breaks down old bone tissue. Then we have an osteoblast. An osteoblast build up or make more bone tissue. And what's really interesting about the osteoblast is they're depositing the extracellular matrix around them, creating this new bone tissue, and the bone starts to ossify and they get stuck. So an osteoblast actually becomes an osteocyte after it sticks itself in this bony matrix that it made. And of course, while it was doing that, it hurried and sent out its cytoplasmic extension so it wouldn't be alone and it could connect to other osteocytes and distribute those nutrients. But what I'll often tell students when we're talking about this is if your osteoclasts and osteoblasts are pacing each other, they're working at the same rate, meaning your osteoclasts are taking a certain amount of bone away and your osteoblasts are matching that, that means your bone density would stay the same. But let's use the example of back in the day when astronauts went into outer space for the first time. When these astronauts went into outer space, they were these really fit astronauts. And they came back after being in space for an extended period of time with pretty much no gravity. And they went to their physicals and they found that their bone density went down from anywhere from 15 to 20 percent. And so what was happening is we had the osteoclasts outpacing the osteoblasts and were resorbing more bone tissue because there was no stimulus or strain on the bone. So in a way, bone is kind of a use it or lose it tissue. Your bone's like, well, if I'm not going to be dealing with any stresses or strains, why would I maintain this extra bone tissue? But let's use the other example. Let's say I decide to start an exercise program. I start running, putting compressive forces on my bone. I combine that with resistance training. That's going to start to stimulate the osteoblasts to outpace those osteoclasts and bone density is going to go up. And this is one of the reasons why exercise is such a great thing for long-term bone health. And especially when we start to hit our 30s. Well, I should say for most of us, our bone density peaks in our 30s. And then it will start to gradually decline as we age. Now we can greatly slow that process down with impact activities, resistance training, and making sure we get enough calcium and vitamin D in our diet. But unfortunately, women are about eight times more likely to develop a bone condition called osteoporosis where the bone density goes dramatically down, especially after menopause. Now, why in the world is that so specific to females? Well, without going into crazy detail here, essentially estrogen has a protective function, kind of it's osteoprotective, and it inhibits those osteoclasts. Remember those osteoclasts were the cells that broke down or resorbed bone tissue. And so when menopause occurs, estrogen levels go down dramatically in some cases, and now those osteoclasts aren't quite as inhibited, and they resorb more bone tissue, and this can cause the bones to have less density and cause osteoporosis, especially in that spongy bone. You'd start to see those little beams of bone or those trabeculae start to thin out. Now, men can develop osteoporosis. It's again, just much less likely. Testosterone also protects the bones and testosterone does decline with age, but just not nearly as dramatically as estrogen does after menopause. One of my hopes from today's video was that you learned information about bones that can actually be applied to your life because application of knowledge is how you solve problems, make decisions and achieve goals. And this is one of the main reasons why we partnered with Brilliant as the sponsor of today's video because Brilliant helps you develop these invaluable application skills through an interactive online learning platform that has thousands of lessons in math, science, data analysis, programming, and even AI. Brilliant's lessons are designed to be uniquely effective. Their first principles approach helps you build understanding from the ground up, creating a strong learning foundation that you can build upon. Each lesson is hands-on and interactive, letting you play with and explore concepts, helping you build those critical thinking and application skills through problem solving and not just blind memorization. So while you're building real knowledge on specific topics, you're also becoming a better thinker. And something I continue to dive into are Brilliant's lessons on geometry. I used to struggle with geometry, so I'm going back to conquer my nemesis, and so far, it's actually been quite satisfying. 
So if you want to try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash IHA or click on the link in the description. You'll also get 20% off an annual premium subscription. Thanks for watching today's video, everyone. If you don't mind, click that like and subscribe button, and we'll see you in the next video.